of all the classic myths of ancient Greece, which would you say is the most remarkable? Would it be the story of Prometheus, the Titan War, the Trojan War, the quest for the Golden Fleece, the rescue of Andromeda? All would be very fine choices, as would be any of the legendary heroes, Achilles, Hercules, Perseus, Odysseus. But there is perhaps one that stands out from the rest. It doesn't come from the writings of Plato, Homer, or Sophocles, but from Nintendo in the year 1987 AD. Not written with ink on papyrus, but as ROM data on a circuit board. Not sculpted in marble, but encased in a gray plastic cartridge. The tale in which I speak of is none other than Kid Icarus. I'm going to take you back, no, I mean way back, to the early days of the NES library. Think of it like the family tree of the Greek gods. There was the era of the primordials, followed by the titans, and then the Olympians. The NES itself had its own primordial age, the black box games as we call them, because they all had that same uniform box art with those distinct pixelated characters that looked just like their in-game counterparts. These games were simpler to play, they were more arcade style, some of them being actual arcade ports like Donkey Kong, Mario Brothers, Kung Fu, and Popeye. Of course, I can't forget Gyromite since that game required a robotic operating buddy. But let's not dwell on that again. But without a doubt, the most prolific game of that launch was Super Mario Brothers, which would change the course of gaming history. So let's get into the next era of the NES library, which would be the equivalent of the Titans. This is when the true legends were born, and I do mean legend. Of course, all those games were previously released on the console's Japanese counterpart, the Famicom. But for the sake of the story, we're talking specifically the North American NES releases. Because it was in the summer of 87 when the Nintendo gods descended before us. They came in swiftly, like a summer thunderstorm. The sky filled with smoldering clouds, churning, brewing in an electric tempest of gaming genius. And then the clouds opened up and the golden rays of heaven shined upon us. And out from the rays floating down came three games. Zelda, Rejoice, Metroid, Hallelujah, Kid Icarus. Well, how would I describe that one? Well, I think the best way to sum it up would be with a very famous quote from the great mathematician, astronomer, inventor Archimedes. In his most famous publication, as he so wisely put it, in those immortal words, fuck it. Yes, in this context, Kid Icarus had a lot to live up to. Is it remembered as an NES classic? Sure, it is. But comparably, it was the Ugly Duckling. Another way I can describe it is, if the Nintendo Summer of 87 was a hard rock metal festival, and you had all these amazing bands perform, like Iron Maiden, Metallica, Guns N' Roses, but the headliner was, uh, Nickelback. Just think, after we first popped in Legend of Zelda, and first took control of the elf-like hero Zelda, oh wait, that's Link. And then we fired up Metroid, playing as the armored suit space warrior, Metroid. Oh wait, that's Samus. Don't kid yourself, if you're as old as me, be honest. Did you know right away? Didn't you skip those opening prologues and ignore the manuals before you eventually found out the real names? So with Kid Icarus, the character's name must be Icarus. It's the title of the fucking game. Well, guess what? It's Pit. Yeah. Well, why wasn't the game called Kid Pit? I guess it has sort of a shitty ring to it. We'll make a great movie, Kid Pit, starring Brad Pitt. Well, the original Japanese title translates to Light Myth, Palutena's Mirror. But for whatever reason, they changed it to Kid Icarus. What's the big idea confusing us like that, those motherfuckers? But not like Oedipus. That guy was the original motherfucker. Anyway, the name Icarus comes from the story of King Minos, who built a labyrinth and put a monster in it called the Minotaur. The idea of labyrinths with monsters has probably influenced more video games than we can even begin to count. Anyway, to build the labyrinth, Minos used an architect by the name of Daedalus, like the Neo Geo Daedalus, which converts your arcade MVS Neo Geo cartridges to play on your AES Neo Geo console. The son of Daedalus was named Icarus, who he crafted a pair of wings for to escape his very own labyrinth that Minos imprisoned them in. The fate of Icarus was rather tragic, as he flew too high to the sun, melted his wings, and fell into the sea. 
with highs and lows, it's very similar to the fate of this game. It sits on a high pedestal along with all the other highly appraised NES antiques. But has it aged like fine wine? Or has it spoiled into vinegar? Let's uncork this bastard and find out. So the nature of this game is simple. It's a 2D action platformer where you go around shooting enemies while collecting power-ups. Not much to explain. It has only four stages, though it's so difficult and grueling it feels more like 50. You're underpowered with a short-range arrow attack. Yeah, Pitt sucks, but at least he's not like the hunter Orion. In the classic Greek myth, did you know how Orion was birthed? Do you want to know? Well, okay, Zeus? Hermes and Poseidon urinate onto a bull's hide. They bury it and out from it spawns Orion. Imagine if your entire existence came from getting pissed on, not just being pissed on, but pissed on by a god, not just by a god, but by three gods. Psst, that'd be the most epic golden shower ever. Wow, holy shit! More like holy piss! Anyway, back to the game. So the first stage is vertical. You know, I'm sorry. I gotta ask, did the three gods piss on the bullhide at the same time? Like a big Olympian circle piss party? Okay, back to the game. Boy, you don't even want to know about the Egyptian myths. Okay, so Horus and Set are in competition to claim the throne of Egypt. Set comes on Horus's hands, and then Horus comes on Set's lettuce, which he eats, and then the god Thoth tries to settle it and asks who came on who, and uh, the seed of Horus actually answers with words. The crazy thing is, I'm not making this up. The ancient Egyptians did. <laughs> yeah, man, you, you thought going all the way back, those stories would be more intellectual than what we have nowadays? No, those gods were pissing and coming on each other all the time. 3,000 years later, Mike Judge creates Beavis and Butthead. Nothing's changed. Anyway, uh, let's start over. So there's this game on NES called Kid Icarus. In this game, you fight enemies while collecting power-ups. Yeah, your health power-ups are... Get this. Wine. That's awesome. That's the best idea of a power-up I ever heard. It's a game made by Nintendo with kids in mind where in order to get your health up, you must consume an alcoholic beverage. And a lot of it. Man, he drinks a lot of wine, and he graduates to barrels. Full fucking wine barrels. I mean, just to get his health up, he's gotta get shit-faced. And dude, wine drunk is the worst. I mean, he, his teeth are like reddish purple, and he's staggering around. It's just... Why isn't this coming out? Oh, I forgot to take the bung out the bunghole. That's what it's called. Not a joke. That's what it's called. And whenever you see wine, you better get it. You think you could go in that door and then come back and it'll still be there? <laughs> of course it isn't. Where's my fucking wine? Don't take my fucking wine away! So if the wine is health, what are the hearts? Well, even though they look exactly the same as the hearts in Zelda, they're currency. Well, thanks again for confusing us, Nintendo. You take those hearts and go into the store, but the store doesn't always have the item you want. So to get the item to appear, you gotta leave the store, and then come back in, leave the store, come back in, leave the store, come back in, leave the store, come back in, do it again, and again, and again, and again. Oh, when you see the item you want, don't buy it just yet, because there's a special sale going on. To take advantage of the special sale, you must pick up the second controller and push A and B. How'd you know to do that? I know what you're thinking. Magazines, right? Nintendo Power. Find the clues that you can use. Nintendo Power. No, no, this was before Nintendo Power. 
Yeah, the power wasn't turned on yet. It was the dark ages. So what did you do before the internet and before Nintendo Power? Well, the answer is you didn't do shit. If there's a strategy guide for this game, it would be only one page and say good fucking luck. I mean, look at this shit. The first stage is vertical, and if you fall back, you're dead. What killed me? The airspace I just occupied two seconds ago? Oh man, not again. And when you die, take a guess what happens. It sends you back to the beginning of the stage. Staying Alive is only the first issue, besides being a Bee Gees song. I'm funny. Next, the game becomes a where the fuck do you go type of game. Yeah, WTFDYG. One of those. Oh jeez, I just barely missed that ledge. Now how the hell I get back there, I don't know. You gotta get the map. It's essential. It basically looks like a waffle. No, really. It is a waffle. Yeah. Pour some syrup on that shit. Oh, but guess what? The map does nothing. In Zelda, you know, that other Nintendo-made game that came out around that same time, wasn't there a little dot to mark where you are on the map? Here, there's nothing of the sort. Th that means it's a waffle. Did you ever have a waffle that had a dot on it telling you where to go? No, pretty useless, I'd say, to rely on a waffle while fighting monsters and navigating through labyrinths. Okay, really now, it is the map. It's not lying, but you need to buy a pencil to mark your spot. A pencil. The character needs a pencil to mark the spot. He's in the middle of fighting monsters, then he has to stop and write shit down. Oh look, I finally get to use something from my fashionable pouch right here. So he's like, oh, wait, hang on just a minute. I gotta write that. Oh, and meanwhile, he's like chugging just massive barrels full of wine and he's got his his sword and his shield and all that shit. And he's got his his, his bow and arrow right here. Oh shit. And then, then he's got like fucking torches and all that. And why does this torch make noise? Why does this torch have to make noise? But here's the deal, we accept it. It's made up video game shit. How does Link carry all that stuff? Doesn't matter. It's the kind of thing you're not meant to think about. But you kind of drew my attention to it there. Not to mention, it's a pencil in ancient Greece. But what'd you expect? He's writing with a pencil, with toxic green lead. Let's talk about the enemies. It's definitely a far cry from the monsters of Greek mythology. Actually, I think, wasn't it the 12 labors of Hercules when he faced off against a bunch of flying Groucho Marx noses and glasses and Goombas? They're Goombas. Did Nintendo rip off Nintendo? Metroids? Um, definitely. It's beyond question. These are Metroids. Maybe the game's named after them. Maybe they're called Kid Icaruses. There's also the Sirens, which are naked as hell if you look in the manual. Imagine being five years old and seeing that. It's a Nintendo manual with tits! But the enemy you don't want to run into is the Eggplant Wizard. This guy was actually one of the villains on the show Captain N. So what happens here, he turns you into an eggplant. This isn't the only game to have eggplants. They also appear in Adventure Island, and likewise, you don't want them. I don't know what it is with eggplants and NES games, but I hear that eggplants have sort of come back into fashion again recently. I don't know why. I'll have to look into that. Or not. So now that you're an eggplant, you can't attack and can't do much of anything. What do you expect? You're an eggplant. You're lucky to walk. So now you just gotta avoid everything. It's like, hey, out of my way. Fucking eggplant coming through. You gotta get to the hospital. Yeah, there's an actual hospital room where they cure you of your eggplant status. Can you imagine walking into the ER and being like, hey, uh, I'm an eggplant. Okay, here's some paperwork. Sit over there. The only thing I hate worse than the eggplant wizards are the bumblebees or whatever they are. Look at this asshole. He just took my protection barrier away. I worked hard for that. I had to buy the wand. Those things cost 700 hearts. And that brings me to another point. The most annoying, taxing, and draining thing in the whole damn game is getting enough hearts to increase your health limit. You have to pick a spot and just kill enemies over and over. In fact, you better do it on level one, because if you don't, your health meter will be so minuscule, 
you won't last on the later stages. I'm not messing around. I'm saying you better get 999 hearts before even thinking about moving forward. It's mandatory. And is that fun? Is that what you want to do? Nowadays, they call this farming. Wonder who came up with that one? Farming? On Nerd Farms, we take pride in growing weapons and health items for your gaming needs. We work with the most fertile ground where purple snakes respawn, delivering fresh to your character's inventory and health meter. Whether it be slices of pizza for your reptilian green friends or boomerangs for your purple bat-suited hero, we raise the finest free-range turkey legs for your vampire whipping adventures. We're proud of the quality of our purple glowing orbs to keep you charged during those alien planet excursions. Direct from the land, we make our own blue shimmering capsules for your robot blasting escapades. This ain't just power-ups, this is family. Nerd Farms, now that's what you call a seal quality. Another term I hear a lot is grinding. You're not going to skip for that one. A few other random things. The password system goes by the term sacred words. Never seen that one before, but I sure have some sacred words to say about this game. The bonus rooms have some weird rules. When you shoot the barrels and reveal the items, you can't touch the item or else it sends you out of the room. And if you expose the bad guy, call it the God of Poverty in the manual, then same thing. You don't get any items. You get nothing. You lose. Good day, sir. So basically, you gotta cash out before you find that guy. Kind of like a press your luck round. Big bucks. Big bucks. No God of Poverty. Ah! Along the way, you spend a lot of time freeing soldiers, or centurions as they're called in the manual. They've been turned to stone by Medusa, but after you've collected them, they fly around and help you out. So, of course I had to get all those guys. Then I get to this purple dragon, which looks as if the Game Over Worm from 3D World Runner and Barba from Zelda 2 got together and... Mm, well, that's quite an image. Anyway, no fear, the Centurions are going to help me. Well, that was a waste of time. By the way, I should have known that red stuff on the bottom is lava. It confused me because it looked just like the hot springs that heal you, or whatever that is. Maybe it's Tang. Yeah, remember Tang? After going through the final stage, which becomes a horizontal shooter, you come to the last boss, which looks like something Matt Groening would create. After you shoot out the eye, Medusa appears. And after she's finished, the game is over. You rescue the princess, she thanks you, and depending how well you did, Icarus gradually becomes more muscular. Sort of like in Metroid, where Samus wears less clothes. And then it says, Medusa was destroyed, and the light of peace returned to Angel Land, but in order to maintain peace, Pit's struggle continues? Oh no. There's a second loop? Well, I'm not playing that shit again. Kid Icarus? More like Kid Dickerus! I'd rather have a Cyclops take a big Cycloptic shit all over my head while Medusa freezes me in the stone, preserving the moment for all eternity. But it is a classic game in its own way. It's great, but it fucking sucks. If all the ancient video game heroes had constellations, I would say Icarus or Pit deserves a spot. Oddly, with all the Greek constellations, there never was an Icarus. It was only in 2018 when a distant star was discovered and named Icarus. At 14 billion light years away, it's speculated that it took so long for the light to reach Earth that the star has likely burned out by now. So to see it would literally be to look back into the past. And that sums up this game's legacy. It shined bright in its glory days, and you can still relive those days through nostalgic memory. I induct this game into the Cosmic Nerd Hall of Fame. So next time you look up to the night sky, think of Icarus.
When I think back to the 90s, I think of two things, slapstick and crude humor. First, slapstick. Looney Tunes was still popular. You know, the physical comedy and visual gags were still being referenced a lot. Animaniacs and Tiny Toons were like direct successors. Then there was Jim Carrey, whose highly expressive face was almost like a cartoon, especially when he had a CG makeover in The Mask. It was like a live action Looney Tunes character. And then the crude humor and bodily functions were on full display in Dumb and Dumber, which had all three, piss, shit, and puke. The Green Day album that year was called Dookie, Beavis and Butthead were at their peak, and Ren and Stimpy had been wreaking havoc the first half of the decade. It was clear the 90s was the age of the gross out, and it was also the 16-bit era. Games of the period were flexing their new technology, showing off more complex character design and animation. Interplay gave us Boogerman, which fully embraced the gross-out trend. The peak of the Turd Mountain, overlooking the Barf Marsh, and somewhere where the butt winds blow south to the vomit valleys and doo-doo dunes, between the boiling ass canyons and solid wastelands, there lies Earthworm Jim. Somebody put pen to paper and said, how about a worm in a spacesuit? And from that point on, the world was never the same. The character appeared in many sequels, including Clay Fighter 63 and a third, which also featured Boogerman. Earthworm Jim had his own animated series, voiced by Dan Castellaneta, best known as Homer Simpson. Groovy! I remember, when the first Earthworm Jim game came out, it was like nothing I had ever seen. And even though it was on both Genesis and Super Nintendo, and was nearly identical, I've always thought of it as a Genesis game. That's the one that came out first, the one I played as a kid, and that's the one I'll be playing now. I have fond memories of this game. Let's see if its inventive game mechanics, fun visuals, and sense of humor still holds up. Some may say it's all about boogers, but it's not. Level 1 starts, and right away, the first thing you do in the whole game is you drop a fridge to launch a cow. It says, cow launched, as if you just completed some major objective. Cow launched? What purpose does that have? Where is the cow now? It has no effect on the rest of the game. You just launch a cow for no reason. It's brilliant. On top of the zany humor, the character animation is so lively, it's like playing a cartoon. Since Jim is a worm, he uses his head like a rope or a whip. He can use it to attack enemies, he can twirl it like a helicopter, or he can hang on to stuff or swing across. There's no shortage of things the character can do, and the control is fluid and smooth. The way he interacts with the scenery feels natural. When he jumps on the pile of tires, there's a certain rebound that feels just right. The music is awesome. In this case, I prefer the Genesis because it has that gritty, bassy sound to it. And the sound effects are hilarious. All the little voices when Jim gets hurt, or the way the birds scream when you gun them down. And then you get to the boss and the guy's making armpit farts while burping up fish. Amazing. I love when you complete the level, he says groovy. Groovy! You gotta love characters that say groovy. Groovy. Groovy, baby. Groovy. Level two, what the heck, is clearly what the hell, as in literally hell. And this has gotta be one of the best all-time hell levels. I mean, just look at it. I'm getting major Disney Fantasia vibes, or Don Bluth's All Dogs Go to Heaven. It's so awesome that I'm having a hard time consolidating everything I wanna say. For the music, they use the classic Ride of the Valkyries, but then there's a record skip and it goes to something super peaceful. But every now and then, you hear somebody screaming. What's going on? The enemies are priceless. There's these chomping monster things, and then there's lawyers. I guess they're making a joke about lawyers and hell. And then there's things you would never think of, like a snowman in hell. And what are these things? Farting assholes? They're farting assholes! I like the evil cat who's in the background the whole time. That actually turns out to be the stage boss, Evil the Cat. Yeah, just a cute little white cat, like Yeti, who keeps blasting fireballs out of cannon. It's little details like the recoil animation. 
and how the cat stops to lick itself. It's great. Not to mention, Jim is out of the spacesuit, which is funny just to remind you that he really is a worm. Level 3 is some underwater base. There's these little orange guys that are real unassuming, but if you go near them, they'll slam you around. Man, that's so cool. You gotta hop on a giant hamster to eat them up. And next thing, you're in a little submarine. So this game is always giving you something new. It has a ton of variety and I can't say enough good things about it. Oh, fuck. Okay, this part might be a problem. Controlling the submarine is not self-explanatory or intuitive. You have to turn the jet propulsions around so that they're pushing you in the right direction. It also gains momentum. You don't want to build up too much speed. If you hit something, it ricochets you back and you lose control. If the glass cracks too much, you're done for. So you want to take it slow, but you can't take it slow. There's a time limit. You got to get to the next checkpoint before you run out of air. Come on, take it easy. Nice and easy. No need to rush. Whoa, that was close. Motherfucker. Fuck! Uh. Oh, fuck it! You know what? I take back everything I said. This game fucking sucks. I'm not even playing around. It's horse shit! You know what? There's more levels. I shouldn't have done that. If you make it past the submarine, next up is level four, snot a problem. As in snot, mucus, boogers. It's fucking nasty. The idea is to defeat the green guy, Major Mucus, by weakening his booger bungee cord till he falls. But don't get bitten in half by the snot monster below. <laughs> wow, it always impresses me how they keep making new death animations. Come on. Ah! Ah! ah. Oh! Come on. Ah! Um, what happened there? Next is the aptly named Level 5. Most notable things here, well, first, Jim gets separated from his suit, and you have to fight Professor Monkey for a head. That's his name, and that's what he is. I've got a monkey grafted to my head. The next stage is called For Pete's Sake. It's an escort mission where you have to keep this little puppy safe. Aw, look at that cute little puppy just skipping around, so carefree. Aw, love that little guy. Oh, 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 oh shit! <gasps> So with a game that has so many fart sounds and mucus and gross out humor, all I can say is, you haven't seen anything yet. Here comes the grossest level in video game history, intestinal distress. What the fuck? Oh. Oh. What is that supposed to be? I don't want to know. Oh. Oh boy. Oh. This is where they took it a little too far. Somebody decided, hey, let's just go all the way and make it as disgusting as possible. On top of that, there's something real disturbing about the music. The whole thing just creeps me out. Oh, but the next and final stage is called Buttville. Oh no. Oh no. Uh, okay, it's not so bad. Just a bunch of spikes and lightning. This part, you better be ready to die, die, and die. In the end, you defeat Queen Slug for a butt, and then rescue Princess What's-Her-Name, and then the cow, the cow from level one lands on her. And if you wait through the credits, they fall through the ground into lava. Overall, it's a great game with great variety and great sense of humor but has some frustrating parts. 
So there you go. I'd like to introduce The Balance of Shit Justice. A game with no problems will sit in the green zone to mark its outstanding excellence. But with every flaw, every turd that drops on the other side, it moves the game into a worse zone. This one, by my assessment, is a rather good game with a few turds weighing on it. Want some more? Well, I figured if I'm going to play through one game, I might as well play through the sequel, Earthworm Jim 2. Consider this a bonus. First up, level one, anything but tangerines. Is it just me, or are things getting even weirder? You're lifting pigs out of pig pens, sending them down slides into fish bowls, putting them on boards of wood to raise weights. If you leave them alone, they meditate and float away. Whenever Jim stands still, he takes a little guy out of his pocket and eats him. You're stealing motorized stair chairs from angry old ladies. And next, in level two, Lorenzen Soil, you're moving dirt around, which is probably the most worm-like thing Earthworm Jim has ever done. And what was that? What did he just do? Scattered in between are these recurring stages where you're bouncing puppies off a cushion or giant marshmallow, trying to get them into a funnel, or else they go splat. Damn, that's fucking brutal. Baby puppies splatting on the concrete? That's fucked up! But you wanna see some crazy shit? Level three, Jim's now a blind cave salamander. You're back in the intestines again. As if anyone wanted to see that. But now you look like an oxalotl. A fucking oxalotl! What's the theme of this level? There's weird membrane shit, pencils, pinball parts, windows. Next thing you're plunged into a game show all of a sudden. How does Jim spell his first name? Wow. I, I, it, it begs the question. Who pitched this idea? And how in the holy mother of shit were they not dismissed as just being a total lunatic? It's as if the whole point was to make everything as random as humanly possible. That'd be like if I came to you and said, hey, I got an idea for a game. How about your, um, an eastern spadefoot toad in the Helix Nebula, and you gotta stab foiled chairs with rubber chickens, and out come marble giraffes, and you have to balance the giraffes on feather wreaths, and you take them to hot tubs full of salsa, which transforms the giraffes into cat trophies, which you have to collect and place all the trophies along a line of Twizzlers before a blue panda comes and eats them all, and then morphs into a giant ball of metal slime! <sighs> Let's play the game. Level four, the Flying King. Uh-oh, somebody switched on the diarrhea dial. The suck power that ass draws turned to full blast. It's bad enough that everything's trying to kill you, and it's like trying to dodge rain droplets in a thunderstorm like in Silver Surfer. But on top of that, you have to keep track of this balloon that's carrying an explosive. You can't let it blow up. And you have to keep pushing it all the way to the end of the stage. But you can't focus on the balloon because there's too many enemies to deal with. Also, whenever you beat a stage, the cows talk. Well done. I gotta ask, what's the deal with all the cows? Some running joke, I guess? I don't get it. What is this preposterous preoccupation with cows? Just some random animal that you can't stop referencing? All right, let's play some more of this buffalo shit. Level five, utterly abducted. Yeah, we're going full cow now. Here, you have to pick up cows and take them into these stables where the machine milks them. The milk fills the pail and lifts up the barrier. Next time, you need two cows and then three or else the barrier won't lift all the way. Did Jim ever think about ducking under the barrier? I guess that would make too much sense. Here's where it gets nuts. The cows can get abducted by aliens. And let me tell you, these aliens want these cows bad. They are persistent as fuck and never go away. That's my cow, get your own. You, you don't know the meaning of suffering until you've been hauling a cow over cliffs and almost making it to the stable only to have a UFO take the cow away. Man, I have some real beef with this level. Get your tractor beam off my fucking cow, you alien piece of shit! If you lose the cow, you gotta go all the way back. If you die, you go all the way back. And if the cow explodes for no reason, you go all the way back! Yes, some of the cows are explosive and you have a time limit to take them to a bathtub to defuse them. Who would think to do that? 
But that's not all. You have to find the cows in the correct order. You think maybe they put a little too much thought into this? The cows spawn from flowers. Yes, I didn't even mention that yet. The cows spawn from flowers. If you come to a flower and it doesn't spawn the cow, that's how you know you've approached it in the wrong order. It would have really helped if they at least had an arrow or something to guide you. But no, you gotta just take a shitty guess. Meanwhile, there's these magician coffins that I can't stop falling into. And if it's not already complicated enough, you have to launch the cow over with a cannon. But then you gotta get yourself over by swinging on snot. Oh my god, can you believe that shit? Oh man, there has to be another way over there. You can't go through? And there's a one-up just to tease you. All right, well, I gotta go back. Fuck! Next, in level six, Inflated Head, your worm head turns into a balloon and you have to dodge everything in sight. If you get hit by anything, it pops your head and you fall back down, down, down. It's as cheap as it gets. You know, variety is one thing, but when every stage is something wildly different, it starts to feel like you're constantly trying to learn a new game. It never lets you get used to one thing, just keeps throwing you these crappy curveballs. In level seven, ISO 9000, you're jumping across piles of legal paperwork. You have to carry mice in rolling cage balls and take them to certain destinations, but the real pain in the ass here is all the killer filing cabinets. These things will not chill. They just keep on coming and they never, ever stop. Man, that's a shitty day. Don't you hate it when you get stuck between a filing cabinet and a magician's coffin? I can't get over that filing cabinet. I know you're supposed to jump on the drawer, but I still can't get over it. He's gonna kill me against the wall. Ah! Level eight is called level eight. As in food. Yeah, you gotta love food levels. This would have to make my top 10 food stages. Look at this. Running from salt shakers and straws, literally whipping eggs, hopping across all types of meat. <laughs> Got some burgers sizzling in the background. Wonder if they're from the same cows. Level nine is a secret level, which you can otherwise skip past. It's called Totally Forked, which is a great name, but the Genesis version here just says forked. So there's some regional differences, and I guess my region couldn't handle the joke. I wonder if there's any region that just straight out called it totally fucked. That'd be great. Level 10 is the final level, thank God. It's called See Jim Run, Run Jim Run. This is basically nothing more than a race against the recurring nemesis, Psychro. Keeping up with this guy is almost impossible, with all these obnoxious barriers in your way and poorly placed pitfalls. It's unforgiving as hell, and if you accidentally get the gun that shoots bubbles, it's useless and you have to give up. If you actually manage to stay ahead of Psychro and beat him to the finish line, Jim hails a cab, which crushes Psychro, he rescues Princess What's-Her-Name, and in a twist ending, all them turn out to be cows in disguise. Wow. Well, Earthworm Jim 2 was an ordeal. The first one was mostly fun, but this one felt more like torture. So let's send it to the balance of shit justice. Well, as you can see, there's lots of turds weighing on it. I don't know, this one ain't the worst I ever played for sure, but too many turds. I think I've suffered enough. But there's another one, Earthworm Jim 3D on N64. Let's see how the franchise held up making the switch to 3D. So I'm putting in some overtime here, opening up a whole can of worms. And who'd want to do that? Worms are gross. And why would they be in a fucking can anyway? Okay, so the game starts up with the most bizarre plot. Jim is in a hospital, unconscious, which is a very cheerful way to kick things off. His friends gather around, which includes Elvis for some reason. So the whole game takes place inside Jim's mind, where everything he does is part of a big mission to gain his consciousness back. Right at the start, you're collecting marbles. Get it? Like he lost his marbles? But then he has to find some chicken's underwear? Yeah, I don't know what the underwear has to do with anything. I'm only briefing you on the situation. The humor gets a little more crude, the phrase clucking hell is used, and Jim flips you off with what seems like the middle finger. I mean, he's flipping the bird, right? 
But the humor has gone so far off the rails, it doesn't come off as funny anymore. Why is he shooting out leprechauns? I'm supposed to knock out enemies with a leprechaun? Yeah, take that! You want a leprechaun in your hood? It caters more to the animated series, which had already come and gone by now. So you hear a lot of the Dan Castellaneta voice, which keeps making me think of Homer Simpson. Worm power! Go! Ruby! Pain! I feel great! Win, win, win! Me, me, me! There's this one thing he keeps shouting. Sometimes it sounds like pain, other times like brain. Brain! I don't really know what it's supposed to be, but you hear it all the time. Brain! 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 Oh no. <laughs> Is that going to be the new Where Did You Learn to Fly? Brain! Another thing you gotta get used to is the music. The first stage has this sort of country sounding song and it just loops over and over and over. Then there's those disorienting camera angles. This is kind of like the curse of the time. It's what happened to many games of this era when they switched to 3D. So if Earthworm Jim already sucked sideways, now it sucks in three dimensions. Brain! The levels are designed with these huge open spaces, as if they made the level first and then didn't have time to put that many enemies in there. So most of the time, there's nothing to comment on. You're just running around. It's flat out boring. Reviewing this game would be like telling you about my entire day. I woke up, I got out of bed, it was a little bit cold, I put my socks on, I went to the bathroom, when I flushed I noticed the handle was a little loose, so I had to get that fixed. You don't want to hear all that shit. BRAIN! There's even a stage where you hear a ticking clock. Let me ask you, is a ticking clock ever a good thing? That's what you hear in school when you're taking a test or waiting for the bell to ring. Tell me any situation where a ticking clock is something that puts you in a good mood or gets you excited. That sound sums up this whole game. Brain! In order to keep sane, I have to do insane things like this. There's the occasional funny thing to point out, like this Resident Evil spoof where chickens are jumping through windows. And this stage is called Poultry Geist, like the trauma movie. Lloyd would be very egg-sighted. There's also a ghost vacuum. Not like the kind in the first Ghostbusters game, but a literal ghost vacuum, implying that vacuums can be alive in the first place and have a soul. Then there's a boss with a cannon coming out of its body. Now, come on. Why did they have to position the cannon right there? Brain! Even though this game is boring and uneventful, it's no cakewalk. It gets just as frustrating, probably even more so than the other games. First of all, those marbles. That's exactly what I want to do in a game, go around collecting marbles. It's just as much fun as Superman 64, flying through all those rings. The worst part's when you die, you lose all the marbles and have to start over. And there's quicksand everywhere. When you land in it, you can't jump. You're stuck and have to backtrack to get on the solid land. Then there's the knockback. When you get hit, it can knock you off the ledge. There's nothing fun about any of this. Ass! And if you want to know what the final boss is, it's a character known as Earthworm Kim, who is essentially a female version of Earthworm Jim. The boss fight is long and tedious. And after it's over, you'd hope there'd be at least a good ending. But no, there isn't. Brain! Well, there you go. I beat the whole Earthworm Jim trilogy. Let's see how this one holds up on the balance of shit justice. Well, the shit really weighs down on this one. I'd say this puts it in a very unfavorable category. Yeah. And if you want to put Earthworm Jim 3D on a scale with Jaws 3D, Fry the 13th 3D, and Amityville 3D, it doesn't even compare. It's not enjoyably bad. It's just bad. For those who have fond memories of Earthworm Jim, I'm here to remind you, it wasn't all fun. It's a mixed bag, but mostly stay away from Earthworm Jim 3D. Yeah. 
Well, anyway, that was three reviews, so let's end this thing. See you next time with more shitty games. Today is the big day. The new Indiana Jones movie is out. That's right, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. It's gonna be good, I have faith. It was only yesterday I was showing you all the games based on the classic trilogy, but now that it's a quadrilogy, I have a little surprise for you. Of course, there's always gonna be games I missed. I already showed you a few based on Last Crusade, but there's like a thousand more. There's one on Commodore 64, which is basically like a shittier version of the Genesis game, which is pretty shitty itself. I remember that's the one where Indy pours from the Grail onto his father, like in the movie. Except, what is he pouring? That looks, um, questionable. Yes, Cindy, right on my chest. Then there's the PC version, which is actually good. It's a point-and-click game, made with a lot of care and attention to detail. The graphics and the lighting are really well done, but hang on. What's Indy doing with the water fountain? If he's drinking, he would be leaning over. So I can only conclude that since this game was developed and published by Lucasfilm Games, later LucasArts, it must be considered canon that Indy is a sink pisser. But anyway, about that surprise, I'm going to do something a little different here. Usually, I take you back to the past, but this time, I'm going to play a new game. Yeah! They sent me an advanced copy of the new Crystal Skull game. I figured, before I go see the movie, I might as well check out the game. I see it has that guy from Transformers. I don't know how that's gonna go, but the big question, what console is this? Um, Dig? Yeah, the Leapfrog Dig. It's a brand new handheld console coming this summer. It's quite an opportunity to be among the first to review it. It's geared towards children and is meant to be educational. Let's see. First, let's get this bastard out of the box. Ugh, you think there's enough packaging here? Son of a bitch. Come on. Oh look, they give you little stickers for overlays. Which one do you prefer? Well, obviously this one. Oh, I hate doing this shit. Get on there. Come on, smooth it out. Oh wait, they give you this protective cover also. So you're not going to see the sticker anyway. Motherfuckers. Let's put the game in. You know, I have high hopes here. I bet this will be pretty decent. It can't be like those old games. I'm sure they learned their lessons by now. So Indy and Mutt are looking for the skull. Hang on, his name is Mutt? What kind of name is that? If they named the dog Indiana, where did Mutt come from? I have a bad feeling about this, Indy. Yeah, I do too. The game starts up and it's a self-explanatory side-scroller. You're jumping around and whipping snakes. But you also have the option of punching. Not sure why. Did Indy just punch a scorpion? And a big one! The scorpion's bigger than him! Imagine if you saw a scorpion that big and had the nerve to walk up to it and punch it! Who does that? Next, he's punching giant rats. It's as big as that thing George Clooney fights in From Dusk Till Dawn. I mentioned this was an educational system. Well, every now and then, you open a chest and have to answer a math problem. But the real problem is this game is a piece of shit! Sometimes you come to a series of platforms. You have to jump on the one with the correct answer, or else you fall through. Could you imagine that? Speaking from personal experience, I'm supposed to be good at math because I'm a nerd, but really I'm not. If this were real, if my life depended on knowing the math, I'd be screwed. Imagine that. I walk up to the platform and then someone asks, Quick, what's 32 divided by 8? I'd be like, fuck! As for those treasure chests, the strange thing is, it's optional. You don't really need to do it, unless you want the points. Some kid could be playing this and they're supposed to be learning math, but instead they skip the chests and just play the action parts. Let me ask you a question. If you were playing a game and you had to choose between solving math problems or not solving math problems, which would you choose? Some stages you play as Indy, others you play as Mutt. 
He's in the jungle, fighting with a sword on top of trucks and jeeps. Next, he's climbing on vines. And the funny thing is, I bet none of this even happens in the movie. What next? Is there going to be a bunch of monkeys? Not happening. When you beat the stage boss, Spalco, the game actually allows you to continuously whack her with the sword. Jeez, how cruel. Spalco? More like Spanko. The game is appropriately easy for kids, but damn, sometimes the clunky control can be frustrating and lead to many deaths. Just a reminder, this is not an NES controller. It's so unfair! Ah, fuck! Shit! Ah, oh, you motherfucker! The final boss is a statue come to life. That'll be in the movie. Ah! Oh. Now, this guy is tough. Man! You motherfucker. You motherfucker! Oh, man. <laughs> well, after finally beating him, Indy grabs the skull. It looks like he places it on a skeleton body. Don't look at it, Mutt. It unleashes its power, much like the Ark, and they escape. I don't know about this game. I guess I have high expectations for anything new, but I am excited for that new movie. I mean, this is more than a movie. It's an event. Crystal Skull is gonna be the last Indiana Jones movie. There's no way they're gonna make any more. It's not like they can de-age Harrison Ford or anything like that. That'd be like if in 15 years, I come back to this same episode. How crazy would that be? Anyway, fuck this Didge game. Didge, you know, it's a piece of shit. Ah, missed. Here, let me try again. Well, the thing's so small, did you really expect me to hit it? Ooh. Ah, nice going, Ray. So, before I head off to see the movie, I want to take a brief look through some of the other games to see ahead of time where the movie might take inspiration. For example, on the PC, there was a game called Indiana Jones and the Desktop Adventures. Wow, real exciting name, right? That would be like calling one of the movies Indiana Jones and the Movie Escapade. It's a precursor to Star Wars Yoda stories. It's an overhead action-based game with a puzzle-solving element. The exploration aspect is great, it has some appeal, but the movement and controls are pretty awkward. Great adventuring, bad combat. But the reason I bring it up is because, keep in mind, this game came out in 96, but the Crystal Skull is in it! Of course, the Crystal Skulls are real-life artifacts with a lot of mystery surrounding them, but the fact they were already included in the Indiana Jones universe means that the new movie may borrow things from the games. It was long speculated that Indiana Jones and the Fate of Atlantis from 92 might be the subject of the next movie. While that turned out not to be true, the game did a good job adding new lore to the franchise. It's another point-and-click game and, for its time, it was very cutting-edge. A lot of thought went into the plot and the artwork is great. The graphics and sound are excellent, it plays out very well and it gives you enough clues to figure out what to click on. Above all, it feels very cinematic, as if this could have been the fourth movie but feels kind of sad to end all the fun speculation. Indiana Jones was, of course, inspired by many old film serials and movies that Steven Spielberg and George Lucas saw when they were young. They were also inspired by comics, most notably all the classic Scrooge McDuck adventures by Carl Barks. So getting back to the games, it's worth looking to see what other Indiana Jones... Wait a minute. That's not an Indiana Jones game! To see what else the fourth movie could draw from, we could check out the 3D games. Indiana Jones and the Emperor's Tomb was fairly recent. It was on PS2, Xbox, PC, all that shit. Here, Indy has to find a pearl called the Heart of the Dragon buried with the first Emperor of China. Once again, it doesn't seem like the new film is based on it, but there's a great wealth of imagination and adventure within that could make for great cinematics. 
This game is another good one, except for some annoying camera angles. You get to use the whip in all the ways you'd hope for, the voice acting is good, the likeness of Harrison Ford is done pretty well, and overall, there's not much to complain about. But there was a game that came out before this one, Indiana Jones and the Infernal Machine. Infernal? The dictionary defines infernal as irritating and tiresome. Sounds like something the Shredder would say, like, BLAST THIS INFERNAL MACHINE! Well, this was the first 3D Indiana Jones game. It came out in 99 on PC and 2000 on Nintendo 64. From what I heard, it was only available at Blockbuster Video. This one's set after the original trilogy. The Soviets are trying to dig up a legendary Babylonian engine that was used to contact an ancient god or whatever. Indy meets up with a member of the CIA who sends him on the mission. You a famous archaeologist. I'm just a spy. Yeah, a spy can't do dangerous shit. Leave it to the archaeologist. Makes sense. The gameplay is very much like Zelda Ocarina of Time. Pushing blocks, the Z-targeting, and the on-screen item selection and button commands are almost identical. One of the weapons you can switch to is a pair of boxing gloves. Come on, really? Indy's carrying around boxing gloves? And when you switch to it, he punches barehanded anyway. I don't get it. Did you see that? I just killed a snake by punching the air above it! You better watch these snakes. If you get bit, the venom starts draining your health. You gotta use the antidote, but if you're not paying attention, you might not even realize it. Having no understanding, the hey, rabble has Indy. thrown down his work. Um, Indy? Snap out disciples. of it! Oh boy, Scattered Indy's talking to the wall again. The that venom is making him feel funny. So you just go around solving puzzles. It is somewhat in line with the movies. He'll do things like climb on top of a truck, and somehow the enemies don't notice him. I mean, come on, there's a guy laying on top of the truck. You can't see that? Then you're doing these shitty leap of faith jumps. Of course, it is an Indiana Jones game. And one time, I actually landed on a button, which unlocked the next part. I didn't even know that was the goal. I'm just making this up as I go. Next, it's an icy winter level. Okay, so what do I do here? Piss Jehovah into the snow? I must say, I love when he swims, he takes his hat off. Because that would be unrealistic, to swim with his hat on. When he comes back out of the water, the hat reappears. So I can only conclude that every time he goes in the water, he loses the hat and puts a new one on. Yeah, confirmed. Indy has an unlimited supply of hats in his pants. What in the name of ass? This game is so fucked it belongs in a museum. The jumps in this game are insane. It seems 90% of the time all you're doing is jumping around, hoping to make it. Get over there! Ah, you motherfucker! Here, let me try again. Oh! Leap of faith? More like leap of fuck you! Ah! I can't take this many references. Anyway, I've gone far enough down the rabbit hole with Indiana Jones games, so I'm done. And hey, guess what? You know what time it is? It's movie time. That's right. I'm off to see Crystal Skull. Well, I'll see you next time with some shorter reviews. You know, I need a little break here. So just stay away from all that foul shit. Go check out the movie, I guess, and I'll see you later. <laughs> oh God. Oh my God. I can't believe it's not as good as Raiders and Crusade. Who would have thought a movie made in the year 2008 would have any CG in it? Ah! If they make another Indiana Jones movie, I'm not watching it. Alright, I'm off to see the Dial of Destiny.
Speaking of which, I happen to have found the real dial. Yeah. It has the power to change the course of history. It's a little old. It's a little smelly, a little muddy. Wait a minute. That's not mud. Oh. This isn't the dial. This, this, this is the diarrhea dial. Oh, I need to cleanse my palate. I need to, to watch something else. I know, the adventures of young Indiana Jones. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I have the new DVD set. I always meant to getting around to watching it. Let's open this bad boy. Wow, this is a lot of discs, and this is only volume one. Look at all these. Oh, and look at all these special features. Yeah, disc 12 has an interactive timeline, historical lecture, revolution, interactive game? No. Let's see if this diarrhea dial works. I guess you just push this. Mm. Oh. Oh, is it possible that these games are getting even shittier? Looks like the nerds got more work to do. Shorter reviews my ass! That looks nothing like Indiana Jones, not Harrison Ford or Sean Patrick Flannery. And it's an educational game? Who wants that? It's a sad thing when you can say the best part of the whole game is playing blackjack. But if this is an educational game for kids, why would they teach you gambling? What were they thinking? Huh. I don't know. Actually, this isn't bad. Considering it's just a DVD extra, they put a lot of effort into it. It's basically like an episode of the show made into an Oregon Trail type of game where you have to manage your supply of food and water. The dialogue is well written and the voice acting is good. Maybe you gotta push it harder. <sighs> oh, I died for no reason? Did I have a snake bite? Did I forget to drink water? I don't know. And you know what's worse? There's three of these games from each DVD volume. Revolution, Special Delivery, and Hunting for Treasure. And they all suck. The drawings look like a discombobulated mess. And when you're not having a lame-ass confusing conversation, you're busy whipping snakes and murdering people and animals. You never have enough room in your inventory. Sometimes it's even full right from the start. I never know what to do, so I find myself just playing blackjack all the time. Because of that, I guess I lost all my money for food and water. On top of the crippling financial ruin, dehydration, and delirium, Indy apparently has broken arms, snake venom, malaria, and dies a broke loser. Since we're on a young Indiana Jones theme now, let's check out the Genesis game, Instruments of Chaos. First, you get a message from Agent Rolf. Rolf? Nobody's name is Rolf. The mission is to stop enemy spies from buying the latest weapon technologies from countries all over Europe. You can play the stages in any order you like. So, I'll try out England. The action starts on London's Tower Bridge. It's a basic side-scroller. Seems pretty average. <sighs> oh, this makes all the other games seem great! Uh, I keep getting zapped by lightning over and over. Every step I take, a bird or something hits me and knocks me back. Get over there. And these construction workers are always in my way. Who'd be working on a bridge in the middle of a thunderstorm? Oh, I can just shoot them? Indiana Jones murders construction workers? What kind of hero is he? There's no clear indication of where to go. Can I go over here? Fuck! Oh, I get it. You're supposed to bomb the gearbox. How are you supposed to know that? So Indy bombs a bridge and kills people. I bet you weren't aware of his dark past. Wonder if that's canon. Anyway, I could not beat this stage. After about an hour, I gave up and tried to bet. Come on, give it to me, diarrhea dial, come on. Oh, goodness. Here, all you're doing is hopping across sheets of ice, and if you thought this game would have smooth platform jumping, you're wrong. You try to calculate your trajectory, but only end up falling in the water again and again. To make things worse, somebody left wooden crates laying around. And just when you start getting some momentum, a fish leaps out and knocks you back. Don't you hate it when that happens? When you're busy trying to jump across sheets of ice and a fucking fish hits you in the face? Then I tried the India stage. Right. 
Just gonna, um, oh, what the fuck happened there? All right, come on, whip. Oh, okay, never mind. Let's get the. Ah, uh, God, come on, die, die, die. Okay, let's go. For, all right, let's get rid of the snake first. Oh, oh my God, I can't even. Ah, uh, come on, die. The problem with this stage is there's too many enemies attacking all at once. It's as if you took all the enemies in the entire stage and crammed them all into one spot. Like the enemies got smart and said, hey, let's gang up on them. There's hard games, excruciatingly difficult games, but this falls to a whole new level of no mercy torture games. Get used to that end screen that says, we regret to inform you, Indiana Jones is dead. As if they want it to sink in. Your beloved character has died because you failed. That's it. The character is dead. Harrison Ford's never coming back to do another movie. And it's all your fault because you got hit by a combination of birds, snakes, flying knives, and a monkey hopped up on drugs. All right, just one last stage. This is it. Last try. You can't go to Germany until you've beaten the rest. And I can't beat a single one so far. But maybe in Egypt I'll have better luck. Let's see. Oh, diarrhea! What the fucking snake? <laughs> Fuck! I don't think I could take any more, but our last hope is the Young Indiana Jones Chronicles on NES. Diarrhea, cha cha cha, diarrhea. Cha. This is the worst Indiana Jones game of all! This is below any human standard of decency! I can't even believe this is real! Why did they make level one so difficult? Right out of the gate, this game bullies you relentlessly. How were kids supposed to play this? There's games that just suck, but then there's games that seem to be made with ill intent. Like this was designed to punish your soul, as if someone hates you. Well, fuck them. They don't allow you to make any mistakes. You might be having a near flawless run, but oops, you get hit, you lose your weapon, and then you're down to your fists, which is useless. You come to a wall of gun turrets like the Contra Level 1 boss. Good luck trying to punch that. I've given every ounce of my gaming spirit, and I can't beat Level 1! Oh. It's killing me. No, oh, no, it's actually killing me. Ah, why did all these games suck? The power glove works perfectly. That's it. I can't fucking take it anymore. These Batman games are amazing! Look, this is fucked beyond belief! Big Rigs is one of the best racing games I've ever played. I'm dying. I'm dying. There's only one thing that could save me.
Oh. Oh shit! Ah! Oh, I should have known! It's a replica! Fuck! Ah! Oh god. Oh, what's happening? Ah! Ah! Back in the day, it was all about Nintendo power. You get that shit in the mail, and it was like hot damn. It was this issue right here. It was the first spring of the 90s, and this is when I first heard of the game. But I'm not talking about that one on the cover. We're going deeper into those pages, further into the ass crack of gaming history. And there it was, a boy in his blob, having already been released in 89. I didn't know if this game had anything to do with the 50s monster movie, The Blob, but one thing was clear, it had a lot to do with jelly beans. I never forgot this page, seeing all those different colors. I didn't process what it all meant, but it definitely made me want jelly beans. Then I saw that illustration of that kid dropping jelly beans into the mouth of a white slimer looking blob dude with his mouth gaping like yum 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 yum. What the hell was this game about? The designer and programmer was David Crane, who worked at Atari and became one of the co-founders of Activision. He made graphics for Kaboom, but he was best known for Pitfall and Pitfall 2 The Lost Caverns, which was loosely remade on the NES as Super Pitfall. I already talked about that one, Super Shitfall. And I very briefly touched upon Boy and His Blob in my Wishlist episode, Part 2. But this game is such a bizarre curiosity piece. It's unique puzzling, and equally fascinating, so I think it might be worth playing through the whole game. Or not. Oh no. Not Indiana Jones. Why did it have to be Indiana Jones? The title font, the music, it's a full-fledged indie spoof. So the game starts up, and if you were a kid when this came out, you didn't have half a clue what you were supposed to be doing. I rented it from the video store, and while I might have been too impatient to always read the manuals, keep in mind, it was the video store! They never came with the manuals because someone always rented it and never returned the manual. Yeah, I mean, it begs the question, who are all these people going around snatching NES manuals? Do they still have them? Bring them back! Yeah, you can cleanse yourself of your sins, walk into the site of the old video store, whether it's a laundromat, a bar, or nail salon, just walk in there, put that manual on the floor, and walk out a new person. So you just had to mess around. You select jelly beans from your inventory, you throw them to White Slimer, and what happens? He transforms. The honey flavor turns him into a hummingbird. Apple turns him into a jack. Apple jack. <laughs> Vanilla is umbrella. Cinnamon is blowtorch. Um, like the blowtorch in Home Alone, the movie, like cinema. Not cinnamon, cinema, man. Okay, admittedly, this is a lot of fun. You'll probably kill 30 minutes just trying out all the jelly beans in different places to see what happens and how this little guy interacts with the environment. So the Blob character, official name Blobbert, is from outer space and must have been partially inspired by the Blob, or better yet, the stuff. Yeah, remember the stuff? But actually, I heard that David Crane said in interviews that the inspiration was a Hanna-Barbera cartoon called The Herculoids, specifically the characters Gloop and Gleep. But it also draws a very strong connection to a certain 80s movie where a young kid becomes friends with an alien visitor who also eats candy. You know what movie I'm talking about. Mac and Me. Blobbert may not seem totally original, but the idea of an AI-controlled character following you around was trailblazing. At the time, this was state-of-the-art, futuristic, mind-blowing shit. It's like, I'm playing the game with a friend, but there is no friend here. I, I, there's nobody else here besides me. The second controller isn't even plugged in. What's going on, man? Whether or not Blobbert is a very good AI-controlled character is a whole other question. 
If you think about it, the entire game is an escort mission. Instead of being free to move around as you please, you have to keep stopping and waiting for him to catch up. Come on, man, move your slow ass. Well, there is one way to make him catch up. You drop the ketchup flavored jelly bean. <laughs> ketchup. <laughs> ketchup. So, what's the goal here? Well, Blobbert comes from the planet Blobolonia, which is ruled by an evil emperor who forces everyone to eat only junk food. Blobbert needs the boy's help to defeat the emperor. The only way to defeat him is with healthy food, more specifically vitamins. Where do you get the vitamins? The vitamin store. But you need money. How do you get the money? By exploring underground caverns looking for treasure chests and diamonds. Wow. How did all this stuff get here? Did a bunch of pirates hide it all? In this area which became a populated city? Whoever built the subway tunnels and sewers never noticed there's a shit ton of treasures? The diamonds alone are as big as the kid. If you found just one of those, then you found the largest cut diamond in the world. And not just one, a whole bunch of them! All to buy a jar of vitamins. Imagine walking into a CVS. You grab the vitamins from the counter, you bring it to the cashier. That'll be $10.99, okay? And then, bam! You just slam that fucking treasure chest on the counter. There's one gold coin just spinning around as the cashier awkwardly stares. So as you're running around searching for these treasures, you'll notice there's a surprising lack of enemies. I mean, this is an NES game after all. Shouldn't there be a million things trying to kill you? It's screen after screen of nothing. The truth is, this game could have used more time to finish developing. The story goes that David Crane had only six weeks to finish it. Well, I think this game took way too much inspiration from E.T. The only thing that can really be considered an enemy is some kind of worm, but it doesn't even come after you. If you go near it, it's your fault. Couldn't keep your hands off that treasure, huh? Then there's a spider web without any spider enemy whatsoever. The spider left that web for you just so you can run into it, die, and feel like a dumbass. You gotta use the blowtorch. All the other hazards are environmental. If you fall from too high, well, oops, fuck that one up. You gotta use the umbrella. Water, well, that one's a given. It wouldn't be an NES game if water didn't kill you. You gotta use the cola bean to make a bubble, which is harder to control than the submarine in Earthworm Jim. But watch out for the stalagmites and stalactites. Those are fatal to the touch as well. So the game makes you feel bad because it's you who did it. Nothing's really out to kill you. You're out to kill yourself, idiot. So here, I'm gonna use the punch flavored jelly bean to turn Blobbert into a hole. <laughs> Get it? Punch, hole. Motherfucker! Well, you can't use the umbrella if you're already using the hole, so your only other option is to have some kind of special sixth sense to mentally detect what exists beyond the boundary of the screen. In other words, it's a fucking guessing game! Uh, no, no, no! I can tell you what kind of hole this game belongs in! Another bean is tangerine to make a trampoline. Well, this thing's based on momentum. The more you bounce, the higher you go. Oh man, hit the ceiling. I gotta get back down. How the hell do I get back down? Ah, you fuck! Get up there! You see what I'm trying to do, right? Oh, oh, oh! Ah! Get up there. Any way possible. Just a hair to the right. Don't, don't, don't! Oh, come on! All right, just want to bounce over to the left. Uh, go left. Go left! Son of a fucking bitch! This is some of the most elegantly designed torture I've ever seen. Gonna use licorice to make a ladder. Oh, come on, I can't go up there. Gonna try it off to the side. It ha oh, you gotta be kidding me. It has to be at the perfect spot. Let's try here. What? Oh, that was some cheap bullshit. This is a prime example of a trial and error game. It only sets you up for failure, and the only course of action is to fail over and over again until you get lucky. It's also a major where the fuck do you go kind of game. You keep running around like an asshole. 
And of course, there was no fucking internet, so we'd have to consult Nintendo Power. Oh, that's cool. They lay out the whole map with numbers. So you just follow the numbers, right? Number nine, stoppy dead endy? This route leads to nowhere you want to be? Instead, head to the left and numbers 10 and 11? Oh, that fucking takes the piss out of me. Who printed that? I want to know who. But nothing compares to this treasure at the very bottom. It's heavily guarded by stalagmites. You have to be joking. Just try to go near it. Just fucking try. And that's it. You're done. I've approached it from every conceivable angle, and I've determined that you cannot get this treasure unless you die. I guess that counts, right? You're dead, but you got the treasure. That's some pirate shit right there. But here's the thing. You don't need to get all the treasures. You just need enough. So fuck the underground, go back to the streets, go to the vitamin store, and cash those treasures in. Now you got vitamins, and you're ready to head to the planet Blobolonia to take out the Emperor. Use the root beer bean to make a rocket. A rocket. Then launch yourself off. Okay, now let me ask a question. This boy dies when he touches water? But he can breathe in fucking space? Now we're on Blobolonia, and remember when I said there wasn't enough enemies or things trying to kill you? Well, fuck myself. God damn, is there enough shit in the way now? Maybe. Just maybe. First, it's the dancing marshmallows. They just go up and down, up and down, but then they start doing these funky patterns. Kind of like the jellyfish in Jaws. They keep getting crazier and crazier. Next, you come to these cherry bombs. Don't even worry about the pattern because they'll just blow up and kill you anyway. Even if you try to outrun them, just hold right without stopping, they will still kill you. Might as well put down the controller and rethink your life. Even if you're not on the same screen, they can still kill you. There is a trick. Use the coconut bean to make a coconut bowling ball. Throw it off screen and wait for it. Wait for it. Fuck! You can throw that coconut, wait all day, but as soon as you decide to go after it, death is waiting. It's a very specific kind of throw in a certain place with a running start. You know you got it when the screen changes to follow it. Wow, that's one hell of a throw. By doing this, you clear all the enemies. But how would you know to do that? The answer is get the power, Nintendo power. Next, it's a cornfield. Yeah, great, now you're being attacked by popcorn. All we need now is corn in the band. Then you're inside some candy factory. It's like Willy Wonka's factory, but even more evil. Two naughty, nasty little children gone. Three good, sweet little children left. There's marshmallows falling off conveyor belts, teeth, and poop piles. Luckily, you got those vitamins. Use the orange bean to unleash the Vita Blaster. Good thing we have that. Now it's like every other NES game where you just run to the right and blast everything. Yeah, shoot that shit, literally. The coconut trick still holds up, but you gotta find the right spot. All right, here we go. Rather anticlimactic, wouldn't you say? Then you go past some creepy gingerbread men who do absolutely nothing. You use the lime bean to make the key. Key lime. Open the door. What the fuck is this? How did Blobbert suddenly end up in a cage? And is this the Emperor? Why does he look like a pale job of the hut? But whatever. It's the final boss battle. This is it. Here we go. What happened? And the evil king is defeated with his own hidden supply of vitamins and all of Blobolonia salutes their savior? Did I win? Already? All I did was throw Blobbert an apple jelly bean. He turned into a jack and knocked over the jar of vitamins. Remember, vitamins are fatal to the emperor. So if you were a villain and had a weakness, a bane that could kill you, what would you do? Well, 
keep a bunch of it next to you at all times. Okay, who's this supposed to be? The Pillsbury fuckface? Or would you prefer Stay Puff or the Michelin Man? The game tells you nothing about him, but I'd assume he's the rightful king of Blobalonia. He was captured by the Emperor, and you've rescued him. And now that he's free, he's gonna send his Blob army to conquer Earth. Yeah, wouldn't that have been a great ending if it said, Congratulations! You've killed us all! Asshole! This doesn't feel like a complete game. It can be beaten in an incredibly short time, providing that you know what to do and where to go. Just to point out how short this game really is, every screen of the entire game is shown in only four pages of Nintendo Power. If they had more time, it would have been great to see more levels. The concept is very original with a lot of potential. The creative puzzle solving elements differentiate it from other platformers on the NES. David Crane advanced the possibilities of gaming in the same way he had done with Pitfall. It may be heavily flawed, but the ingenuity shines through. It did, in fact, win Best of Show at the Consumer Electronics Show in 89, and it received the Parents' Choice Award from the Parents' Choice Foundation in 1990, citing its positive human values. For example, always have a healthy diet with lots of variety, like licorice, vanilla, root beer, and cola jelly beans. There's things more important than money, and that's treasure chests and giant diamonds. The road less traveled is the road where there's nothing and you'll have to turn back. Life is tough, Life is unfair, so just cheat and roll that fucking coconut bowling ball. This game is something that could have only existed in the 80s. After all, it's a game about jelly beans, which was the favorite candy of President Ronald Reagan. As a kid, I didn't know the difference between Ronald Reagan and Ronald McDonald, but the point is, that's some 80s shit right there. And what a way to close out the decade. To some, it may just be another obscure NES game, but to others, it's remembered with great fondness. Its legacy continues, and whether they're conscious influences or not, I'm reminded of Blobbert when I see Adult Swim cartoons like the character Squishface in Sea Lab 2021, or Meatwad in Aqua Teen Hunger Force with his transforming capabilities. There is a new version of Boy and His Blob on the Wii, so it's very clear that it hasn't been forgotten. Hopefully it'll get another sequel, or maybe an expanded version, maybe even an animated series in the future. These would all be great ways to fulfill its potential. There's truly no other game like it. But maybe I'm being too positive here. I haven't broken or shit on anything yet, so I'm gonna end by saying, fuck this game. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
no. I've done that already. It was almost 20 years ago when I described it as an awful steaming pile of goat shit. And then years later, I said my own shit would be offended to lay on this loathsome piece of filth. I went soft on it. Yeah, because there's no way I could sum up this total desecration of the NES library. It's cursed, it's unholy. Nobody wants to play Jekyll and Hyde. I've always wanted to play Jekyll and Hyde. No. That last review is pretty detailed. I think I told you just about everything you'd want to know, but I didn't actually make it to the end of the game. I mean, how could I? It'd be impossible. <sighs> I never beat the game, but I'm the nerd. This vocation gives meaning to people's lives, and I can't cut it anymore. I'm unfit. I've lost my faith in the NES library. You're gonna die up there. The fuck? What an excellent day to play some Jekyll and Hyde. Oh, you'd like that. Intensely. How many more years do I have to play this? Until you rot and lie stinking in the earth. No. Let's finish this now. There's not going to be any more Jekyll and Hyde videos. This is it. My opinion has not changed. Yeah! <laughs> <sighs> I told you mostly everything, but for a recap, you play as Jekyll on his way to his wedding. That's all he's trying to do, but for whatever reason, every person, animal, and insect is trying to kill him. You have a weapon that can't harm anything except for one enemy in the entire game. The bees. You walk slow as ass, you get knocked backward by everything, and what makes it extra frustrating is that it doesn't look like it should be that hard. The most unassuming townspeople just charge through you, and those spiders, you'd think you could just watch the pattern and go under. But they don't have a pattern. It feels as if they're programmed to hit you automatically. Making progress is so slow because every few seconds some guy drops a bomb and you have to start moving away from it, but you either get knocked back into it or it still seems to hit you from a mile away. There's projectiles raining down constantly. You're so busy dodging you actually forget that they're dog turd piles shit out by birds. And that pissing fountain sums up the whole thing. I've struggled to explain before how the Jekyll and Hyde transitions work because I still don't fully understand it, but basically you have a life meter and a meter meter. Yeah, some call it the Hyde meter, but the manual calls it the stress meter. And that's the most accurate because this game will raise your stress through the fucking roof. Whenever you get hit, sometimes it depletes your life meter and other times it depletes your stress meter. When the life meter is gone, you're dead. But if the stress meter is gone, you turn into Hyde. When you're Hyde, it's slightly more playable. You have to kill enough enemies to raise the meter back up and become Jekyll again. As Hyde, there's more than one way to die. The most obvious is if you get hit too many times. But also, if you randomly slip off a wall, you'll also die. And that's ultra bullshit. 
The other thing that can happen is if Hyde gets as far as Jekyll, so the Hyde world is like some kind of reversed mirrored dimension of the Jekyll world. If Hyde gets to the same spot as Jekyll, lightning will strike and it's game over. I guess the idea is that the forces of good and evil are battling over Jekyll's soul. So if Hyde overtakes him, that means evil has triumphed. What were they thinking? They were thinking too much. The sixth and final level is the pure definition of hell. No, it's as if there was another hell beneath hell. This is fucking insane. There's these rolling barrels that keep on coming. Sometimes you can't even jump over them because you'll get hit by the next one. And sometimes one single barrel can hit you multiple times. Who's throwing these things? Donkey Kong? If the barrels weren't enough, you also have the mad bomber to deal with. And don't you think it would have been reasonable to not have the barrels and bombs on the screen at the same time? How is anybody supposed to get through this? The mad bomber respawns infinitely, which is one of the worst offenses in retro gaming. But this is the most relentless and merciless respawning I've ever seen. As soon as he exits on the left, he immediately reappears on the right in a never-ending loop. Oh, you could kiss my fucking ass with that. I can't even move. Ugh, you take one step forward and then 10 steps back. Look at this. In the last 20 minutes, I've only moved an inch. Motherfuck. If you really want to know why this game is so bad, just try to play this stage. No, 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 don't. Fuck. Fuck. Fuck! Mm, fuck! Mm. Ah! <sighs> well, once again, that's about as far as I can get. But wait a minute. Hmm, the Japanese version. The Famicom. I've heard this one has some differences, so maybe it doesn't have the same bugs. Oh my god, level one is completely different. I've heard of the different levels, but now that I'm actually playing it, I can say it's way harder, if you can believe it. There's people in Windows throwing everything they got, and it's like navigating through a fucking shitstorm. Level three is also different. Once again, it's people throwing shit out windows, but you also have the simultaneous bombs and barrels, plus slingshots. I didn't know such a thing was possible. Could it be that these two levels were too shitty for America? That's saying a lot. But anyway, they didn't just cut two levels. What they did here, they changed the order. They, they took to... Let me give you some visual aid. Okay, so here's the Famicom, levels one through six. And here's the NES, levels one through six. Okay, so... Level one of the NES version is level uh, four of the Famicom version, uh, which is also level uh, three of the NES version. Um, level two of the NES version is level five of the Famicom, which is also level five of the NES version. And then level four of the NES version is level two of the Famicom. And level six is um, the same. Yeah, so if you ever thought the NES version was repetitive, that's because there's two levels you play twice! Other things you'll see in the Famicom version that you don't see in the NES is mermaids. Yeah, mermaids. The spiders seem to be even more hell-bent to kill you. Like I said, there's no pattern. Your best bet is to just keep walking and hope to get lucky. Look at this shit! The singing lady is also programmed in the most heartless and inhumane way. If you have enough coins, you can pay her off. But regardless, she's hard to even get near. Her musical notes keep knocking you back. And even after you've made it to the other side, they still keep knocking you back. Don't you think, by all logic, once I'm on the right side, it should start knocking me to the right? I even turned around to see if it would matter. But no, it still knocks me to the left. It knows, it's deliberate. Some asshole actually programmed it to be as inconvenient as possible. And the final level, all you need to see is this. The screen from hell. <sighs> oh 
I must confess, I cannot beat this game. But I don't want to grow old and have regrets. I'm not coming back in 10 years with Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde re 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 revisited. No, this has got to get done right here, right now. But I need help. But who? There's no experts. Old shitty game design like this is so out of date that even the most modern gaming technicians cannot dissect or even understand how it was made. This type of thing's been discarded these days, except by the most ill-fated shit seekers who keep it in the turd locker as sort of an embarrassment. Wait, what was that I said about growing old? Hmm, well with age comes experience, and this requires experience. I know what to do. It meets the conditions. It's an honor. Come in. Nerd! We should begin. Well, shouldn't I tell you the background of the case first? Why? Well, it's taken many manifestations. There's the NES version, the Famicom version. There is only one. Come. We must gather some things. The game is a liar but it'll mix lies with the truth to confuse us. It'll attack us psychologically. Don't listen to it. You must use the doors to hide in. But when I go in the door, I come right back out. You must time it precisely. Ah, it works! But sometimes I can't avoid both the bombs and the barrels. Then you must let the bombs hit you, but not a direct hit. If it's far enough away, it'll deplete your stress meter, but not your life meter. But then it'll turn me into hide. But when you come back as Jekyll, all your life will be refilled. No shit. Never try to pass the bomb in. Always walk to the left. Move the screen to the right only when you have the chance. But that takes forever! When you become as patient and as saintly as me, you'll understand. Oh! Man, I'm, I get it now! You just gotta keep slowly pushing that screen to the right. Just like inching out a turd. Precisely. You got this. Now. I'll perform the ritual. In the name of Nintendo and the seal of quality and all that is good, I cast this unclean game out. Whoa, 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 what's happening to the bomb? It's stuck under the screen. Oh, this game's definitely possessed. Be gone, foul game. Deliver us from this accursed abomination. Your mother sucks cartridges in hell. I denounce you, fallen tyrant of unholy game design. I sanction the plastic and circuit board back from the clutches of the vile demonic designer that disguised its evil within. Strike terror to the beast, laying waste to this cartridge. Redeem this game, so it may never be held captive by this unholy shit spirit. <laughs> You'll never beat me. I cast you out! <laughs> you can't win. Like fuck!
fuck, I can't! There's the chapel, I'm almost there! Oh my god! I'm gonna do it! I did it! <laughs> That's not the real ending. You missed the final boss. It's true. There's a different path. Are you telling me this game has two endings and a final boss? In the manual, it is known as Latul, a mysterious ghost-like demon who appears, attacks, and disappears again. Latul? Yes. <laughs> ah. Now let us rest before we start again. How did they do it? Why did they make a game so bad? What's the point? I think the point of this game is to make us despair. To make us see ourselves as animal and ugly. To make us reject the possibility that God may love us. <coughs> <coughs> You must become Hyde. Take distant hits from the bombs. Make more progress as Hyde to overpass Jekyll. Excuse me. I thought Hyde reaching the same spot as Jekyll was bad. You're gonna endanger us. Not necessarily. There's actually a very small chance we'll survive. By taking the rooftops as Hyde, you can bypass Jekyll, thus evading the lightning blasts. No shit. So I gotta beat the game as Hyde? Exactly. You got this. Almighty Nintendo, who created this library of games and who gave third-party powers to those who have tarnished it, give us pity, pardon our sins, and give us the strength to conquer this infernal game! Oh! Whoa, 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 don't fall, don't fall! Be gone, hostile being. You are guilty for those you have tortured. Guilty for the souls of the entire human race! Damn me. Oh, oh, it's the final boss. I, I never thought I'd see this. It's the final boss of Jekyll and Hyde. In the name of Nintendo, it is they who command. They who will judge and compel you. Uh... Oh. Nintendo power compels you! 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 <laughs> Nintendo power compels you! <laughs> I did it! I did it! Oh. Oh no, no. I, I still have to play as Jekyll? 
Wait, where's all the enemies? I guess now that the boss is defeated, the enemies are gone! Oh, wow! I can just walk through? I can just walk through it. This is it! The true ending of Jekyll and Hyde! There's the bride! You actually see her! And she walks just as slow as him! Boy, these two are made for each other. You know, I've never been more happy to see two video game characters get married. You know, good for him. Thank God he made it through all that. Sure, he showed up covered in bomb ashes and bird shit, but he made it! He's not gonna end up in the fucking doghouse again! He did it! And fuck all those townspeople who tried to stop him! Fuck them and fuck this game too! I did it! I beat Jacqueline Hyde! Yeah! <laughs> you didn't beat the Famicom version. Oh, what, the Famicom version has a different ending? Uh-huh. Oh, no, no, I'm not doing it. You ain't gonna... Hide from this one. <laughs> oh, fuck you! Okay, okay, okay. I beat it. Now where's the difference? Where's the difference? Show me! Where's the difference? It all looks the same! Where is it? Where? Where? Oh! There it is! There it is! The bride! She's in a different dress before the wedding! There's the difference, you fuck! Take me! Leave that Nintendo cartridge alone! Take me! Take me! Dark clouds, lightning, ominous organ music, and then, ready for it, ready for it, Final Fantasy III. When you saw this fiery font emerging from your CRT TV, burning across the room to your flannel couch and heard those epic chords ringing out across the wallpapered walls of your wood furnished living room, littered with fruit roll-up wrappers and Sunday newspaper comics, you knew you were about to play a Super Nintendo game that was truly super and unlike anything that came before. Right away, you're told of an ancient war that reduced the world to a scorched wasteland and magic simply ceased to exist. Now, machine energy is on the rise, but there are some who would enslave the world by reviving the dread destructive force known as magic. Can it be that those in power are on the verge of repeating a senseless and deadly mistake? Now that's taking video game storytelling to a new level. Kinda goes above and beyond go rescue the princess or some shit. The main story opens on a snowy peak. We're introduced to two soldiers of an empire and Terra who's under their control. The soldiers are named Vix and Wedge or Biggs and Wedge in the Japanese version, a Star Wars reference. They're in search of an elusive magical being known as an Esper, who they have reason to believe is hibernating somewhere in the icy caves. They mentioned that before Terra was under their control, she had fried 50 of their soldiers in under three minutes. It already raises many questions and builds mystery. Are you enthralled yet? This is some good shit. 
The three march into the snow in their mech suits, known as Magitech armors, as we realize we just watched a pre credit sequence to a video game. We watch them trek through the 3D Winter Wonderland with those Mode 7 graphics and that emotional cinematic score as we anticipate the adventure that awaits us. We are about to play the greatest video game of all time. That's right. We're doing this. And what better time? Because I think of this as a winter break type of game. I remember the time off from school. And also, there's something about the cold, downcast, melancholy state the game embodies. Also, with the holiday season, I thought I'd give myself a little bit of a gift. You know, because last time I played one of the worst, most fiery, hellish games of all time. But now, I play its winter polar opposite. But with good games, sometimes there comes a different kind of trauma. Let me tell you a little story here. As you probably know, this is not a game you just pick up and play for 20 minutes before you hop on the school bus, or even a couple hours after you've done your homework. This is a game that you chip away at over several months. It's a work in progress, a hobby of sorts, that you invest yourself in. This is a game you catch up on while you're sick. It was the longest, most all-consuming game of its era. It came out in 94, but sometime I'd say by the summer of 95, I had finally made it to the final area, Kefka's Tower. The finale was in sight. My heart was pounding, my pulse was racing, I was approaching the end of the most epic gaming experience of my life. All of a sudden, the game froze. Yeah, the screen broke up into glitchy colors. Through decades of foggy memory, I'd say it looked something like this. I had never seen anything like that happen before, nor have I ever seen anything like it since. The game restarted, or I had to reset, I can't remember which. The opening scene replayed, which shouldn't happen, so that was a bad omen. So nervously, I waited until I got to the first save point, and there, sure enough, all my save data was erased. True story. I was definitely an angry nerd that day, especially for a kid with no real life responsibilities, no family to support, nothing like that. No, having your Final Fantasy game erased was a big fucking problem. And that was how my childhood experience with that game ended. And in almost 30 years since, I never again attempted to beat the game. I just could not bear to invest myself in it so deeply again. It's like losing a pet and then deciding to get another pet only to one day again face the inevitable. That was fucking sad, I'm sorry. But that theme of loss is commonly cited as being a big part of the game's storyline. And now that so much time has passed, maybe it's time to give it a shot again. Because I'm going to do it. This is my second chance. I'm going to complete my childhood. When this game first came out, it was the most expensive game I ever bought with my own money. It was close to 80 bucks when most Super Nintendo games were closer to 60. I distinctly remember walking into KB Toys at the mall with my saved up cash. I remember the clerk agreeing that it was overly pricey, but to be fair, he said this game takes like five to eight months to beat, which back then was a big deal. The manual was almost like a whole D&D book full of character stats and information. It even came with a double-sided map. Final Fantasy III was the biggest game of its time. Also, I just gotta say, I know. I've been calling it Final Fantasy III because I'm playing the Super Nintendo version and that's what it's called. Of course, the Super Famicom version is called VI, which we all know is the true sequential number. But back then, I had no idea and neither did anyone else I knew. Not until 7 came out on PlayStation and I was like, what? How did we get to 7 already? Now, everyone knows the story. I even covered it way back in my Chronologically Confused episode. The mix-up has long been cleared. Everyone calls it 6 now. But the cartridge still says 3, 
The title screen still says three. Every time I play it, it still says three. I try giving it the finger and telling it, fuck you, you're wrong. But the game still says three. Fact. So what made this game different from other fantasy adventure games like Zelda? Well, everything. This was the first RPG I ever played. My first glimpse of it was at a friend's house. I remember seeing the battle screen and wondering, why are the characters just slashing at the air? Why are there a bunch of numbers popping up? I wasn't used to this more automated, luck-based fight system. What is this, I thought? Some kind of flashy board game turned into a video game? I actually wasn't that far off, having already owned those role-playing board games like Hero Quest and Dragon Strike. I wasn't fully aware how far back its history went with D&D. I didn't know RPGs were a thing, but after Final Fantasy III on Super Nintendo, I sure as hell did. Anyone who's played the game knows how it works, but basically, you build up a large ensemble of heroes. You travel through towns, caves and dungeons, collecting items, fighting monsters, meeting people, gaining spells and abilities, and steadily advancing the storyline. On paper, it's like your typical adventure game, but one of the things that made it so extra special for the time was the massive amount of weapons and accessories to equip yourself with and all the magic and skills to learn. Once you start acquiring the espers, you can assign them to characters so they can learn certain spells as you go on. This all gives the player the freedom of customizing your characters however you see fit and trying out different combinations of abilities. Speaking of customizing, just the fact that you can name all of them was a fresh concept. Sure, you could do it in games before, but not with that many characters. There's also lots of parts where the characters split up into multiple groups so you get to pick who goes in each group and who leads. The characters are really the core element of why this game was so groundbreaking. Never had there been such an amazing ensemble, all with their own unique personalities and rich backstories. The camaraderie of these characters really shines through. It's all about building the team. It's Wizard of Oz. It's Lord of the Rings. Over the course of the adventure, you come to know them, almost like real people. And the fact they can achieve this with little pixelated sprites and minimal graphic technology is a major accomplishment. Passion always comes through in spite of limitations. There isn't even a clear main character. They all seem just as important. If I had to pick one, I'd say Terra, whose father was an Esper, which is where her gifted magical abilities come from. Much of her story is about trying to find her identity and place in the world. Having fought on the Empire's side through mind control, she now tries to rectify that by fighting alongside the heroes. Celeste, or Celis, also used to be on the Empire's side and has been genetically powered through magic. She eventually turns against the Empire. Locke is a thief, or treasure hunter as he prefers, who's bitter after his girlfriend was killed by the Empire. He eventually has a romantic yet complicated relationship with Celeste. Edgar is the King of Figaro who pretends to be in alliance with the Empire, but is really on the good guy's side. And on top of that, his entire castle is set on fire. So he's also had his share of tragedy. He's a little bit sketchy though. What the fuck? Sabin is Edgar's brother who leaves the royal life to be free. He looks like Guile, and his blitz moves use similar button commands to Street Fighter. Kyan is a samurai-type character. His town's water supply was poisoned by the main villain Kefka, killing almost everyone, including his wife and son. Shadow is a more mysterious type of character, a ninja assassin, an outlaw vigilante. He has his loyal dog by his side, and he always comes and goes unexpectedly. The best is when he swoops in to help during a key battle. Gao is sort of a Tarzan-type character, living in the wild, raised by animals. Maybe that's why he scoots on the ground. Ugh, like when your pet leaves those shit comets. There's also Setzer, the Han Solo-like gambler with the fastest airship, which happens to be called the Falcon. There's the little kid Realm and her surrogate grandfather Strago. There's Galgo with the power of Mimic. And Umaro, the brute yeti who's so physical, he actually throws the other characters. <laughs> Look at that. And my favorite is Mog. What's his deal? Well, um, he's a Moogle. 
I don't know. I, I just love this guy. So fucking cute. So with all these characters, it really shows how far games had come by that point. Long gone were the days when it was just pick the guy or pick the girl. Now it was so much more than that. And those are just the playable characters. We can't forget Kefka. Kefka is possibly the greatest video game villain ever conceived. He suffered from an experimental magic infusion by the Empire, which made him go insane. After rising to power, he's become a psychotic tyrant who is hell-bent on senseless destruction. He backs it up with cynical, pessimistic ideology, making statements like, there's no point of clinging to life when everyone must eventually die. The dude is messed up. Kefka has caused so much turmoil and given all the characters their own individual reasons to consider him a mortal enemy. Despite ripping the world apart, he brings these characters together with a common goal. So the game is very heavy on characters and story, and that usually is the most discussed aspect of the game. As far as the actual gameplay goes, it's innovative as well, but does it have some flaws? Sure. Probably, but in this context, they are forgivable, especially given how pioneering this game was. The random encounters on the overworld screen can get a little annoying, and the leveling up and grinding can sometimes feel monotonous, even though the combat screens are so strangely addicting. Leveling up to max can not only take an insane amount of time, but can also make the game too easy. Also, when you're in a town, sometimes people can get in your way. Come on! Come on! Move your ass! Oh, come on, dude. Come on, get out of my way, you fuck! Ah! Oh, no, 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 come on. Out of my way. Walking in general can feel a little clumsy. You can't go diagonal. Squaresoft later corrected this with Chrono Trigger. Man, now that's a fucking good game, too. Hmm, maybe that's the other greatest game of all time. The movement is much smoother. I also like how you can see all the characters following you. But in Final Fantasy, they all sort of combine into one character. I never understood that. You know, one time I was working at a convenience store and this guy came in and then he like split up like, like his body, like divided into four people. Yeah, turned out he was with his family. It is cool that the game shows you how much time you've put in, although I don't know how accurate that is because it's possible to leave the game on while you're not playing. Also. Why does it tell you how many steps you've taken? Are the characters wearing an early version of a step tracker for fitness? One of the things I hate is whenever there's a boss or enemy that has a fatal attack that nukes your entire party. So you have to time it with a life 3 spell or anything to revive at least one member or something to avoid it. This doesn't feel like strategy. It feels almost like a cheat. When the game is unfair, you gotta be unfair. I am aware that sometimes it's possible to get softlocked. Yeah, it's rare, but say for example one character dies and the other one in the party has paws casted on him, situations like that can really suck because now you lost a whole lot of progress. Let's talk about the abundance of attacks and spells. First of all, the characters all have their own special abilities. Kyan has sword tech where you charge up an attack, Shadow throws weapons from your inventory and has his interceptor move, Mog has all the crazy dances, Edgar has tools like a drill, and a chainsaw complete with a Jason Voorhees mask. I don't use his Bioblaster that much, but I love how it looks. Strago has the lore ability to learn the enemy's spells. And because Setzer is a gambler, his moves are based on a slot machine outcome. Gao has Rage, where he uses the enemy's attacks. Sabin has the Blitz moves, like I said. It can suck when you mess up the button command, but these moves are some of the most powerful in my experience, especially the bum rush. But my favorite might be the suplex. I mean, the dude can pick up an entire train. That's hardcore. As I already mentioned, you can teach all the characters spells with the espers, but also you can use the actual espers to cast massive spells of their own. There's some amazing psychedelic graphics here. It does things you wouldn't even imagine were possible on the Super Nintendo. I remember when I first saw this stuff, I was like, what the hell? It seemed like my TV screen was melting. Then there's the more comedic Esper spells like Cat Rain. 
Yeah, just a cartoon cat that comes by. The design of the enemies is a work of art in itself. They differ from the tiny pixelated hero characters since they're so detailed and can be very large. Take a look at Atma. Is that thing intimidating or what? How about Chupan, Poltergeist, Behemoth, Doom, or Hades Gygus Colossus? That's metal as fuck. Final word on the graphics, with all the spells and enemies, it's a marvel to look at. It's some of the best stuff to come out of the SNES. But it doesn't stop there. The sound effects are amazing, and the music by Nobuo Uematsu sounds like it could have been the score for a major film. There's been lots of great video game soundtracks up to this point, but this took it to a whole new level. Some of the best music is featured in the opera scene, and speaking of that, this is one of the most memorable scenes. Fans have praised it for its storytelling and its epic nature. There's no denying what an ambitious achievement this was for gaming. But the actual gameplay, my god, this is the most tedious part. So basically, in the story, you're Celeste taking the place of Maria, an opera singer. The whole thing is a scheme to trick Setzer to get him into your party. But anyway, what sucks about it is you have to remember the song lyrics, which you find prior to that. But if you mess any of it up, you have to start all over again. And there's about 30 minutes of a stretch where you can't save the game. As a kid, you did not want to get called to dinner or get interrupted in any way, or God forbid have a power outage. Back then, before auto-saving and sleep mode and before the internet existed as we know it today, we would often get stuck and had to ask friends to share information on how to get through. Not even Nintendo Power offered much help to this game. I mean, how could it? But let's talk about one of the game's most pivotal chapters of all. It happens after Kefka opens the gate to the Esper world, which causes a major geological event where the entire island becomes the floating continent. The group drops from the airship onto the island and proceeds to embark on a massive dungeon-like sequence, navigating through an elaborate and unstable maze of crumbling areas and teleportation holes and fighting all kinds of difficult monsters. The fact that I have to gloss over this part of the experience says so much about the importance of what happens next. At this point in the game, you've played for so long, you would be more than satisfied if this were the final confrontation. Doesn't it seem like it? Kefka kills the Emperor, officially making himself the head villain, and he unleashes the power of the gods. If this were an Indiana Jones movie, this is where the villain would be destroyed by their own recklessness. It has all the formula of a classic confrontation that would be followed by a final peaceful resolution, but no. You race a timer to leave the continent, and when you reach the edge to leap back onto the airship, you're given the option to wait for Shadow, or else you permanently lose him. As if you're not already shitting your pants, this guy makes you run the timer down to almost the last possible fucking second. After this, we witness a global catastrophe unlike anything before in a game. The ground rips apart, people fall into earthquakes, the airship is torn in half, everyone is scattered and lost, and then we're met with a black screen with a simple line that resonates so much. On that day, the world was changed forever. Imagine playing this as a kid, back in the day, before the internet as we know existed, and we didn't know what was gonna happen next. I mean, this could be the ending, it could just be one big miserable downer, or we could be nowhere near the end. Celeste awakens on a small deserted island being cared for by Sid, who's like a parental figure and has a lot of history with the Final Fantasy series. Anyway, after she gains consciousness, Sid succumbs to his own sickness, and you need to care for him by catching and feeding him fish. He can either live or die, which doesn't change a whole lot with the outcome of the game, but if he dies, you witness the most depressing scene of any game I've ever played. Celeste goes to the top of a cliff, reminisces about Locke and how everyone's gone, and with nothing left in her life, 
She tries to end it all. Looking back, this is the darkest and most shocking thing I've ever seen in a game that was played by kids. But Celeste survives, finds out Locke is still alive, takes a raft, and embarks on a new quest. By going in such a dark place, the game is able to make a point that no matter how bleak things seem, there's always hope. When you think about it, this is why Kefka is such a relevant antagonist, because he thinks life is meaningless. He uses his own trauma to spread despair and bring down all the others. He tries to make all the other characters give up. Do you want to give up after how far you've come? Hell no! Even though you've lost everything and now have to find where your friends have gone, collect all new items, and explore the transformed landscape, which is now called the World of Ruin. This idea was not a brand new concept. Zelda Link to the Past had a similar idea with the light and dark worlds, but the way it's done here is entirely different and more relatable. As you go on, all that talk of the previous world and how things used to be makes so much more sense as an adult. As a kid, how are you supposed to reminisce on the good old days? You have to grow up and experience life first. So for that reason, what I'm trying to say here is that not only does this game hold up today, it's actually better as an adult. Jeez, all that talk of how the world went to shit is eerily similar to what happened in the spring of 2020 when it wasn't even possible to function in the same way or do the same things. But we made that climb back. We restored. We're fucking back. And likewise, this game gives you that feeling of building back. Because now, you have to play the rest. In the words of Rambo, nothing is over. In the words of the angry video game nerd, we're only halfway through the fucking game. Look at all these stairs. Look at all these fucking stairs! Wait a minute. I'm having a flashback. When we get to 20, tell me. I'm gonna throw up. So once you've gained back all your characters, leveled them up enough, learned enough spells, and build up all your resources, you can make the call and go to Kefka's Tower. You divide into three parties. The choices you make are crucial because each group is going to be taking an entirely different path. You're going to have to survive through many battles. So unless you spend enough time grinding, you might end up with one party that's way weaker than the others. So hopefully you have their powers spread out wisely. This is it. The final challenge and the place where my game glitched. Remember that theme of loss? I lost my whole fucking game and now it's time to get it back. ask a question. Have you ever walked into a bathroom to fight a monster? Yeah! He's right near a toilet! That's a real shitty battle. Kefka's tower is an endurance. You'll be begging for a fucking save spot and have many close calls. Oh man, I hope it doesn't glitch again or anything else happens. Just kidding, I have a battery backup. Yeah, it's all good. Oh, hey, look at that. The power's back on already. Okay, all right, let's beat this game quick. <laughs> uh, Santa? Oh, Merry Christmas, nerd. Merry Christmas. 
there's nothing I love more than filming skits. <laughs> hey, Santa, I'm a little busy right now. Are you still playing that game, nerd? Why, that was last year, wasn't it? Oh, 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 oh fuck. Well, you could use a break from that game anyway, right, nerd? You know, you're right. I could use a break. Santa, Santa! Oh, scum sit on my lap, little boy! Well, actually, I'm gonna sit you on your fucking lap! Oh! Oh! You take a fucking oh! break! You're not ah! cold for Christmas, ah! nerd! Ah! Oh, it erased it all too? Oh, what the fuck? Oh, no, that's it. No, 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 no. I'm not letting this go. I'm gonna beat it right here, right now. Anyway, now that I'm back, I made it through Kefka's tower. The three parties reach the final area and regroup as one full ensemble for what can only be the climax. I've done it. I've made it to the final battle. Kefka gives a cynical speech about the meaningless of life, while the heroes counter telling of what they've learned through the course of their adventure and the things they hold dear to them. Friendship, family, love, freedom, all their stories have come together in a satisfying way. And then Kefka calls for the greatest power of the universe. Standing on top of fiery peak, he says he'll create a monument to non-existence. This is when you start to wonder why this wasn't written as a stage play or feature film. Next, you determine the order your characters fight in, and then it's on. Holy shit! It's Satan! What else could it be? And if this wasn't enough, after he's defeated, the screen quakes and scrolls upward as you must face a whole tree of bosses. It's like bosses growing upon bosses upon bosses. Mother fuck! Oh my god! What is this all supposed to be anyway? It's like you're fighting Renaissance art. It's as if Michelangelo's The Last Judgment came to life and tried to kill you. And the haunting choir and organ music gives it an epic biblical effect. Some have even said the three tiers of bosses represent hell, purgatory, and heaven. Dude, if you have to fight hell, purgatory, and heaven, you better just call it a day. Yeah, and we're not even at Kefka. This is not Kefka as you'd expect. After becoming so familiar with that clowny little sprite, now he becomes a wicked angel floating against a golden cloudy sky blasting with heavenly light beams. They went above and beyond to make this the most epic final boss in gaming history. And I can't stress enough that if you're not leveled up properly and have enough life three spells, you're just gonna get wiped out in one hit. Oh! I'm gonna do it! I'm gonna do it! I'm gonna do it! I'm gonna do it! Oh, oh, I did it! I did it! After almost 30 years, I finally beat Final Fantasy 3 or 6. When you first hear that deafening crackle and see Kefka wither away into ashes, it's a feeling like no other. You just beat the greatest game of all time. And then you get a cinematic ending that goes on for over 20 minutes. Just sit back and enjoy 
because for everything you went through, they knew when they made this game that you fucking deserve it. Another bucket list item checked off. It was worth going back and reclaiming that magic. I feel nostalgia is at its most powerful this time of year. The magic of the holidays harkens back to a more innocent time. The game itself is about characters who are literally trying to reclaim magic from a bygone era. And I can say the magic inside this cartridge is still strong. On the top tier of the good ass scale, there's a few levels. Games that are good like Robin Hood, dope as a kaleidoscope, and fuck me through the fucking ceiling! This was the first gaming masterpiece of its kind. And there's only room in life for so many games to make such a lasting impression on you when you're a kid. And for me, this is it. This is one of those. And now I feel a sense of closure that I finally completed it, having taken, whew, almost 30 years. But now, now that's finally done, guess what? There's 16 of them!